being busy is not a status symbol. Today, we're going to get nerdy with a book report of Greg McCowan's New York Times best selling book, Essentialism. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Reagan, and you've discovered Unicorns Unite. This is a podcast for freelancers, service providers, virtual assistants, and curious listeners who would like to experience the freedom and flexibility of working virtually. We're the magic makers, movers and shakers, and the real people doing the work behind the scenes of online businesses. Welcome to Unicorns Unite. Hey everyone, Emily Reagan here. I'm so excited to have you here on the podcast. So I am a book nerd. I love to read, and I like to throw in business books to help me get smarter and wise up to the industry. I always learn a ton. I'm not really good about listening to books on Audible. I guess some of you really love that, but I am a reader. I like to read. And I recently finished this book called Essentialism by Greg McCowan. It was really good. And I usually do these little mini book reports inside my back-end membership. It's called the Digital Media VA Workgroup. And I usually give a quick rundown of what I learned and how to apply it to your freelance or service providing business. And then I move on. But today I thought I'm going to share this on a podcast because I just feel like with the times, with all of us working from home, us moms juggling multiple hats, I just felt like this is really important to hear. I do encourage you to pick up the book and read it. It's good. I don't think it's a must read to be successful in business by any means. So if you're struggling because you feel overworked, overwhelmed, stretched too thin, this is a book that could help you regain your focus. The whole premise of this book, Essentialism, is about slowing down, being deliberate, and being focused. Because really, in life, there are few things that are truly valuable, and the rest of it is all noise. It's not about just having less. It's not about decluttering and being a minimalist. It's about focusing on the essential relationships and living an essential life. So Greg goes through different traits of an essentialist versus a non-essentialist. And there's lots of good stories of overworked executives who really learn to narrow down, focus on that one thing, and then they have big results. And I want to bring this to your freelance business and teach you how you can apply this to your business. And we'll get into our three rules of essentialism that you can apply and walk away with. But first, a little background. A non-essentialist thinks everything's important. They think they can do everything. They think, how can I do it all? And they have a hard time saying no to anything. Meanwhile, an essentialist realizes that everything is a trade-off, right? You're always trading your time. Essentialists realize that almost everything is non-essential. There's only a few key things in life that are truly essential. Essentialists only say yes to the top 10% of opportunities. They use very narrow, explicit criterion to make sure they're choosing the right activities and opportunities. They're being very selective. And they realize that they can only do one thing really well. And the book gives some examples of people who went really big on one thing or made small changes to one area or really focused down on one area of a business. And then they had big results, big profits, big impact in the world. And it gets a little bit confusing when we think about the service provider, especially because a lot of us are virtual assistants. We are the generalist, the well-rounded person doing all of the things. And I'm not trying to undermine my whole idea of a unicorn who can come in and do it all. Essentially, a unicorn still has to pick and choose and decide what's essential for a business, right? And I'm not saying that you have to specialize. Obviously, there can be really good results when you specialize and you'll get there. You don't have to start off knowing it. My whole mantra is you start off in the freelance world, as a virtual assistant, knowing lots of things about digital marketing, able to help your clients, you figure out what you're good at, you figure out what you like, you figure out what pays well, and then you narrow down. And you don't have to narrow down to one small area. You could be a mix of little things inside digital marketing that make you unique. I'm not saying you have to do all of the things. It would be really hard to be an online business manager and a marketer manager and dealing with all the social media marketing, right, for one business. Eventually, you will narrow it down. But at the beginning, 
I do coach that that first hire for a solopreneur is often the implementer who can help. But very quickly, you will be narrowing down and focusing, right? But essentialism really comes into our world as freelancers because we have to manage our client expectations. We have to prioritize our own life over our clients' businesses, right? It's so easy to want to help clients and start running their business for them and being way more invested than we should be and knowing when to draw back, knowing what's essential, what can wait, and really not falling into that problem of being a people pleaser and always saying yes. There's a saying out there that's really popular. If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And that is essentialism. Not saying yes to everything. Not doing everything for your clients. And I'll get into some tactics with how to do that here in the podcast. The big thing that essentialists ask is what is the trade-off? What can I go big on? What's the one thing I can focus on here? When we're helping businesses online, we're managing a lot of the little things all of the time, and it's always adding up. But one of the things that's really helped me set apart my digital marketing services over the years is helping my clients produce that consistent content. This is where they struggle the most. And I think of that as being crucial and essential to a business. Little things can wait. Little problems in the inbox, the DMs, some of that stuff can wait to me. But it is crucial that the business owners show up consistently on social media, in emails, and blog content. Blog content, not always, but I think that's a big portion of a lot of people's businesses. But if those business owners aren't doing that essential work, there's not a lot to stand on. It's harder to grow their business. So knowing what's essential when you are the unicorn doing all of the work is important. Is it more essential to be working on a long-term project or do they need to be making money right here and there? Like this could get really deep here. But essentialism is really about focusing on what's truly important. One of the big questions in the book, and it kind of ends with this, which I really actually love, is what is the most important thing right now? I think he calls it a win. It must be the acronym, right? I can't remember. Pick up the book and you can look for sure. What is the most important thing right now? And I have to do this all the time in my own business. What's the current client fire? What client work do I have to do right now? Do I have to get done today? And what's one thing in my own business I have to get done? There's also a really good section about hiring. And I think this would give you great insight As a person who's going through the hiring process, you're trying to find that long-term team, that six, seven, eight-figure team to work with, and this gave a really good insight for business owners. And it was all about the 90% rule, which is very similar to the 80-20% rule that I teach a lot. I talk about the Pareto Principle. It's actually been mentioned here in the book, but I hadn't heard of this one. It's called the 90% rule. So if you're rating whether you should hire someone, whether you should do the work, if it doesn't rate above 90%, then you reject it. This is all on page 105 if you want to check it out, if you have a copy. It's all about turning down options and having faith that the perfect one will come along. You're making a decision ultimately by design and not by default, not because you have to, not because it's just good enough. So this is good for you as a freelancer when you're deciding to work with a client or not. If you've gotten some experience under your belt, which I teach you to do, and you're not necessarily desperate, use the 90% rule to tell if you should work with that client. It prevents you from aligning with clients who will be a waste of time, who are just not good enough. If they don't rank above 90%, then say no. And this goes with the hiring process too. When you're looking at candidates, if you're a business owner listening to this podcast, or maybe you're thinking about subcontracting or adding to your team and growing a micro agency, if that candidate is not above a nine on the 10 scale, reject them. Don't hire them. I've heard business owners say, and this is referenced in the book too, it's better to be understaffed than hire the wrong person too quickly. You want to make sure you're hiring the right fit, that person who's above 90%. And some of the questions to ask 
when you are thinking about hiring and for you to think about when you're interviewing with a client. Would he or she love working here? Would we love having them on our team? Is this someone I'd want to work with every day? Could this person have been one of the founding members of this team? Those are questions for business owners to ask, and you can totally flip that as a service provider, as a unicorn, as an independent contractor and freelancer, if you want to work with that client. Would you love working with them? Do you want to work with them every day? If it's not a hell yes, then it's a no. They do cover the hiring process a little bit, and they had a really interesting story about this one furniture company who would judge people based on the way they put their tools away. It was really kind of funny when you think about it, but there's little things that can give you insight when you're hiring, and you have to trust your gut. And in this example, they had somebody who just kind of built the furniture, did really well, and then just kind of like threw their tools back in the toolbox, and they're like, oh, nope, that's a hell no. So... (laughs) One of the questions early on too was, which I find interesting, especially in this day of age when we do a lot of Zoom calls, but you know we're secretly judging on Zoom calls. I know it's normal to have kids on the call, but there are certain calls you just don't have your kids on. And that should be one of your discovery calls. And in this book, they talk about the first stage of hiring to get on the phone with somebody and just test out, is this person organized enough to find a quiet place and meet us in the right time zone and have a conversation? And just that process alone eliminates a lot of people, believe it or not. So think about that with your discovery calls too. And think about that with your clients. Are they hopping on discovery calls with you, not completely prepared? That might say a lot about working with them, right? And if it's not a 90% or above, then it's a reject. There's two things I want to talk about really quick that Greg mentions in this book. And one is about the importance of sleep, which having a good amount of sleep makes you clear-headed, makes you focused, it helps you do the work. There are so many times where I think, I'll just stay up really late and get this client work done, and then I make mistakes. Or then the next day, I make more, more mistakes, or I get even more behind. I don't actually gain from that staying up late. <laughs> then I'm a cranky mom. And I love that this book kind of dispels that myth that the entrepreneur doesn't have to sleep. They can just get up really early. And sometimes I hear about all these like crazy early morning, miracle mornings. And I just think, well, crap, I can't get up at 4 a.m. and work out and do this stuff. I'm tired, y'all. So tired. And that's okay. Sleep is so important. And he gives you permission to sleep. And I freaking love that. The other thing that really matters to an essentialism is play. Having time to play. And I'm totally guilty of this. I have been such a hustler. If I wasn't overloaded with client work, I was trying to build my business. Then I was doing the mom thing. I've done a lot of time with my husband gone, being deployed and whatnot in a way. And there's not a lot of play time. And Greg gives you the permission to play. It's good for your brain. It gets you back on track. And isn't this all about having a life we love? Sleep and play are important for us mentally. It lets us go back to that task, really focus, double down, and make a bigger impact with that thing we're trying to go big on. With essentialism, it's all about living your life with no regrets and reinforcing the fact that you have a choice in the matter and you can decide on what's essential. If you don't decide, someone else will. So let's get into our three rules of essentialism. And this is really going to matter for those of you who are people pleasers client pleasers. Those of you who are listening, you know who you are. Just remember, if it's not a hell yes, it's a clear no. Hey, this podcast is sponsored by my very own GIF and sticker making workshop. Turn your clients' videos into GIFs, design branded stickers for Instagram stories, and master the art of making your own GIF for promo emails. This is fun unicorn magic that we can do behind the scenes easily for our clients. The workshop is one hour, just $17.99. The link is in the show notes or go to emilyreaganpr.com slash GIF workshop. That's G-I-F workshop. Back to the show. So this first rule is about saying no. And I love that inside the book, he has a whole section on ways to say no. I mean, this is 
good. This is good for some of us who can't help but say yes to everything, right? He gives you practice ways to say no. So put this in your arsenal, practice it, and be ready to say no when it happens, right? This is really hard for a virtual assistant or freelancer or project manager or integrator or OBM who's working with a business owner who's a visionary and truly has a ton of ideas, a ton of ideas. And instead of saying, yep, I'm on it, yep, 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 and then being resentful and bitter, Greg gives you two things to say. You could say, yeah, I'm happy to make this a priority. Which of the other projects should I deprioritize to give attention to this new one? Put it back on the business owner. Let them decide. You cannot do it all. You are now officially an essentialist. You realize it, and you will do your best to not try to do it all and do a crappy job. One thing at a time. You might also say this, really get them to think, hey, yeah, I'd love to do that. I really want to do a good job. But considering my other commitments, I just won't be able to do a great job. And this reminds your clients that you would be neglecting some things if you chose to say yes and make them decide what that trade-off is. This is gold. So many times business owners throw a shit ton of stuff at us and expect it all to be done right away. And that's just not what it is. Are you hiring me to do this? Do you want to get the consistent content out first? Do we want to work on this big project? We just have to manage expectations here. And you do have to learn to say no. You're doing them a favor if you can say no and communicate how long things will take and what's realistic. I think about in the military where nobody wants to tell the general the truth. Everybody wants to be a yes man. And in the military, you're not supposed to say no ever. And then I find these four stars, get all of these yes men all under them. I mean, we can think about the president in this case scenario. They get all the yes men under them, but they're not really getting the truth on what's going out there if they just have people who are afraid to tell them the truth, right? It's not reality. And think of yourself as doing a favor when you're when you do set the reality, paint the picture, and let the business owner make that trade-off decision. Number two for your rules of essentialism boundaries. If you cannot articulate your own boundaries, you cannot expect your client or anyone else for that matter to respect your boundaries or even know what they are. You have to have boundaries. When do you work? How do you communicate? When do you not work? How do you not communicate? I cannot stand Voxer as my primary mode of communication with clients. I had one client and I would look down and the team would have 80 messages for me to listen to in one day on Boxer. And it was like, that was just, (laughs) I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. That was not my form of communication. You need to think about your deal breakers. What are the services, tasks, activities, and requests that you will say no to? Write those down. Be prepared. Really think about it. What's your deal breaker? For me, I will not be required to be attending any weekly meeting. I'm a contractor. I'm not an employee. I will be resentful if I have to show up every Monday to a meeting. Not only that, if the business owner slash client is canceling them half the time and not consistent with them, I sure as hell won't be there. That's one of my deal breakers. You cannot expect me as a mother of four, as a military spouse, to be showing up for consistent meetings. Now, if it's for a project and it's scheduled out, that's one thing, but not reoccurring forever to infinity and beyond meetings. So one way to figure out what your deal breakers are, or think about those times where you have felt really violated, really bitter, or put out when someone makes a request, when a client makes a request. Have you had a client who just rubbed you the wrong way and you can't figure out what it was? It's probably a clue to your hidden boundaries. So those Monday morning meetings are one of my bitter resentful things. I shouldn't be expected to show up every morning for a meeting when the business owner can't do it. Another thing is uh, staying up too late. I got really bitter once when I stayed up till 1 a.m. to help a client rebuild her entire membership site. And... It was a boundary that I broke. I stayed up way too late. I wasn't compensated for that. I wasn't appreciated for that. And I've like screwed my family over. 
And I was bitter about that, but that was all me. She didn't ask me to do that. So really think about when you have felt like that. I would love to hear when you felt like that. It would help me out right now because I'm kind of drawing a blank in my own business, but I know I felt like this a lot. I know I have felt like this with clients and I couldn't figure out why. And it was a difference in those boundaries and it was a difference in those values. You have to clearly put up your fences. You have to mark off your time. You have to save your energy and you have to do it well in advance. Oh, I remember. One of mine was when I go on vacation or when my client would go on vacation and we'd all plan ahead so so she could take off and then it was my turn to go on vacation and I felt like I just brought the work with me and I was contacted all of the time during my vacation and I felt very violated. Okay, I'm sure you can think of more. (laughs) Not to get all negative here. All right, number three, I love this one. Number three, rule of essentialism. Buffer. Build a buffer. Essentialist, he goes on. I mean, there's chapters in depth about this, but he goes on to say that essentialists really look for effortless execution. They're trying to keep things simple. And in order to do that, you need to expect the unexpected. So you can either wait for things to go wrong or you can plan and prepare. So as a freelancer, You can plan and prepare, and you do that by buffering. You add project time, you add time to your deadlines, and you give yourself that leeway for things to go wrong, for tech to go wrong, for websites to shut down, for your kid to get sick, for the internet to go out. Don't leave everything up to a timeline that depends on perfection. It's not going to happen. We already know it. Something's going to go wrong. I actually heard this advice at the copywriting conference in real life that I attended earlier this year, and I thought it was really good. There was some very big-time copywriters talking about their projects, their large tens of thousand dollar contracts with clients and brands, and they told us to pad in 20% time. And they also talk about like adding extra costs to it. But the time thing is what's going to help you when the unexpected happens. And you, yeah, it looks good if you can turn things in earlier. Like if this quiz funnel, I can get it done fast. But guess what? Things are going left and right with the website. There's multiple people involved with this quiz funnel I'm working on right now for a client. And it's slowing us down. And it's all beyond my control. We should have thought about that. We should have planned on that and given a realistic deadline. Nobody's groaning over here. It's a good lesson to learn. It's the perfect client to learn this lesson with, but I see it now. Always add a buffer. So I really hope that these three tips to buffer, to set boundaries, and to say no help you out in your business. I think this book was really good. It's a quick read. It's not very long. I gave a good synopsis here. I think I did a good job kind of switching it to the context of us working online. And you could probably skip reading the book too, but if you're a book nerd like this and you want to read it, I would love, love, love for you to get back to me about it. And let's talk about it. And what else did you learn? I have a ton of pages earmarked. I didn't get to it all. I mean, I'm not going to like rip off his book in this entire podcast, but I love that you can apply essentialism to a freelance business, even when you're not always in control with clients and the client work, right? You can still be an essentialist and keep things simple and focus on the big parts of a business that are going to move forward and be okay not having it all done, right? Be okay with some areas not being the focus. So I'll put the link to the book in the show notes and you can grab it. That will be in my affiliate link for Amazon, of course. And yeah, check it out. And I'd love for you to tag me on Instagram if you're reading it. I'd love for you to tag me listening to the podcast or better yet, leave me a review. That would really help out, especially as we close out 2020 here. So next week on the show, we are going to be talking about tangible tips for networking, completely different than what we talked about today. Networking, not all of us want to do it. Some of us kind of groan thinking about it. Like, how do you send that cold message on LinkedIn saying, hey, want to work with me? Yeah, we're not going there. Even if you're an introvert 
and you hate the thought of doing networking, my friend next week on the show, Allie Jones, will be telling us all about how to do it right. I'll see you then. If you're ready to learn the digital marketing and social media skills that will get you hired online, head over to vacrashcourse.com where you can learn about my five-week program, the Digital Media VA Crash Course. Small business owners and solopreneurs want to hire someone who gets it and who can help them implement just about everything. They're looking for a magical assistant who does it all. With my comprehensive training, you can get your foot in the door and become a unicorn. Check out vacrashcourse.com. Even when you're not essentially scratch that, but if you're struggling because you're feeling overstretched, not, not that. The whole premise of this book, Essentialism, is being deliberate, slowing 